The Holy Gospel according to Luke in the fourth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. And then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you, I will give their glory and all of this authority. For it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus said to him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Luke brings us into a microcosm of what the story of Exodus is all about. We recall the Pharaoh's enslavement of the children of Israel and how Moses was raised up to lead forth the children of Israel out. And they go into a desert and it is said that for 40 years they wandered and it was an up and down situation at one moment the faith of the people were firmly resolved at other times, they revolted, they complained, they wanted to go back. They didn't know where they were going. And not even Moses, God's chosen, was allowed to enter into that promised land as they came to the very ridge and looked down. Because Moses, as great as he was, just wasn't perfect. And as a result, it is said that he died before the children went down into that land of milk and honey led by Joshua. And Luke takes this story and he compresses it into a much smaller realm. There is no big crowd here, but there is a singular person in the terms of Jesus as kind of this new Moses, and there's no big crowd to fight over and against. It's just him over and against the power and the lure of evil personified in Satan. And so it goes that the power of evil always wants to tempt to go beyond one's position in life. God didn't let Moses do that, but somehow this Jesus, whose story we hear in Luke in the beginning of a wonderful birth of shepherds, and then we hear of his wonderful baptism and the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And it seems that why would he have to go into this position of this kind of temptation over and against what is personified as the total evil of the evil one, the Satan. But Luke makes it very clear that now this becomes very personal. It becomes very one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's this Jesus who is seen by the evil one with that beginning words of if, the conditional sentence, and whenever there is a conditional sentence, if you are, it invites a response. If then. And so Satan looks at him and says, if you are the Son of God, if you say you are who you are, then why don't you do this? Why starve if you're the 
the Son of God. God can do all things, can he not? And Jesus reaches back and he starts with those words, it is written. He does not come out of this of himself. He reaches back in everything that was ever taught to him as a child, saying, it is written. One does not live by bread alone. He knows what he has been taught and he carried it around with him. But that's not enough, okay? So then the evil one says, look, I own all this, and he sweeps his hands to the whole world and says, it all belongs to me and you can have it. If you then will worship me, if, I'll give it all to you, everything. Jesus replies once again, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only, the memory of a psalm. Okay, a third try. Up onto the temple, the very pinnacle of the temple. If you are the Son of God, go ahead, throw yourself down. After all, if you are the Son of God, is it not written by the psalmist? He'll protect you. He'll command angels on their hands. They will bear you up. You won't dash your foot against a stone. Isn't that what God could do for a son? And Jesus answers him and says, It is said, is it not? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Isn't it interesting that in every three moments of these temptations, there's nothing new coming from Jesus. He kind of reaches deep into everything he has ever learned out of the law and the prophets. He carries it around with him. It's almost as if this is what he needs in order to live the life of who he is called to be. And if there's something to be said about Luke's gospel speaking to us this morning, we who live in such a far different world than Jesus lived, there's probably a lot more things out there that look at us and say, if you are one who believes in God, then why don't you do this? If you say God loves you, then why would you worry about anything? Why would you be so careful in bringing up your children? Why would you be careful and how you treat the world, after all, if you are who you say you are, won't God take care of you for this? If you say you are who you are. And that, of course, is the major conundrum of what it is to live and say that, yeah, I'm a Christian, but the message is you've got to carry around the thought patterns and the words. Let them be your own, whatever you choose, out of Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You could use that. Or the fool in his heart says there is no God. Pick and choose the ones you need, but you've got to be ready. Because the power of evil always wants to bring us to think that we should have that power, that somehow we are the type of people that really, really are exceptional. Yes. And when that happens, the very difficult thing is to see ourselves as honestly as God sees us. That we're not all that strong, we're not all that powerful, and the grasp for power is something of an illusion. And even now, as we are working in our own land here through the primaries, and every time you turn on the news, you hear the latest insult of one political person over against another, the power that they think they possess is what they think is going to convince us that, oh, here is a person of power. This is the person we will support. It's all very illusionary in many ways. And it doesn't really matter what party you belong to. It just heats up, and they said. In the news, I heard that they were saying that South Carolina is the state of political chicanery, that they do all of these things in order to bring the other person down. And it's so much easier to bring somebody else down than bring yourself up. But evil likes to do that. Do it at all costs. Give yourself your own accolades as best you can. 
And I'm not meaning to pick upon politicians. It's a human trait, isn't it? That we don't like to be on the bottom. We like to be on the top echelons of things. Hardly any wonder when Jesus talked about what the kingdom of God was, that the uh, rich shall be poor, the poor shall be rich. Everything will be turned upside down. And it's a vision, you see, that's not really something that we like that much. It's kind of alien because we've been told to excel. And in that excelling comes that great temptation that says, if you are who you say you are, then you will show yourself to be smarter than the person sitting next to you. you now, if you happen to be a husband and wife sitting next to each other, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> I don't know why you never listen to me. I'm always right. <laughs> Have I not proved that? And of course, that type of speech going into the ears of the partner says, okay, keep it up. And they sit there and they load their imaginary Colt 45 with six good bullets of memories they can shoot the person down with very, very easily. And as that other person is being shot, they say, oh, you're asking for it now. You see what I mean? If you loved me, then you would, uh-oh, the biggest bullet of all. And so it goes. It looks like a big story going on here, a battle between Jesus and the evil one, and it is a condensation of the big story in the Old Testament of Moses and the crowd brought down one-on-one -on -one between Jesus and what evil is all about. Why? Because that is the plane that we all live on, don't we? We live on a one-on-one -on -one war, not only between ourselves, but also within ourselves. I remember a song came in mind, and it came from a Walt Disney film, Cinderella. And have you ever heard of that? There was a song in there that said, I give myself very good advice, but I very seldom follow it. That's what New Year's Eve is all about, now, isn't it? But the reality is, once again, it's just as if the place of Jesus is now replaced by us. And the place of Satan is now replaced by our other side. The war that goes on within ourselves. Should I do this? Yeah, I should. No, I don't think I should. Ah, uh, yeah, but maybe I should. No, I shouldn't. Oh, the war goes on. It's like the little personification. You know what I mean. The little white angel on one side and the red devil on the other. Your ear. Oh, come on. Who's going to get hurt by this? Yeah, but I don't know. What are you ready to say at that point? Jesus knew what to say. He dug deep into it with all his learning of the Old Testament, came up with the right answer at the right time. And so the question is, have you got your answers ready? What, what at, the, at those moments of your deepest problem, when you could waver each way, where are you going to pull? What are the words you want to hear in your own ears at that moment? Jesus had them right at his fingertips. So what do you want to be able to say? It's got to be more than, oh, now if I do this, I'll get embarrassed. No, it's got to be more like words that says, no, that's not who I am. That's not what I'm called to be. So you see, this morning's gospel is not just a story back then. It's not just a story of one man against one person, uh, personification of evil. It's all about us. It's all about what we go through in our own lives. And it, it's that promise, you see, that whatever we have gone through, this Jesus, who is both the God and both the humanity of what we share, is not untested any more than we're untested. But beware. Because down at the bottom comes the absolute truth, and I think we all know it, don't we? And when the devil had finished every test, he departed him when? Until an opportune time. And there's the kind of warning that comes out of Scripture. Beware, be on guard. As the Scripture says, the devil like a lion prowls around. But the reality is sometimes that lion isn't just something outside. Sometimes it's walking right around inside our own brains. The balance of going back and forth. So here we go. We're walking into Lent, right? 
And all of the stories that we're going to hear for the following Sundays are going to be stories of Jesus getting from one point to another. He gets closer, he gets closer to Jerusalem. Everything that has got to happen has got to go to Jerusalem because that's the very central force and point of everything of what God is all about. The memory of Moses, the exodus, the moment of time when Joshua goes to claim the land, the prophets coming forth, the moment when all of Israel is taken out of where they are into Babylonia, where they're captive, and then they return, and then Rome comes in. It's like they were born for calamity. And we say, well, that was back then. But think back, all of you who sit here, from the time you were born, has the world ever not known calamity? Never. I was born in 1942 in June, the seven months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, when this country was revving up in order to go to war. And just when it looked good after that war ended, within five years, the Korean incursion, and we thought we could breathe, but we couldn't. And then when that all ended, finally, we thought we had a breath of fresh air. In 1958 came a recession. People thought, oh, I thought it was all going so good. And then suddenly the quagmire of Vietnam. Suddenly we're in that all over again. And then when we think that we got out of that one somewhat gracefully, but in a way that we didn't think, we thought we really would win that war, but we didn't really. And then there is that point of calm that is always waiting for the storm, because that seems to be how the world works, doesn't it? And then suddenly Afghanistan, and suddenly there is Iraq. And it doesn't really matter at this point what your political viewpoint is, does it? It just simply said that that stuff goes on over and over. Our world isn't much different from what Moses faced as he moved his people out of slavery. So, if there are those moments in time when it all seems to be too much, when it seems like you need to give up and say, why don't I just join the crowd? What the heck? Life is terrible, then you die. So get what you gotta get, because it comes all too soon. And that is that time when that temptation of the devil, on the little red guy on one shoulder says, go for it, go for it. And the angel on the other side whispers, but that's not who you are called to be. And that angel says, are you ready? And we say, ready for what? And the angel says, to be who you are called to be? And we say, what shall I say? And you have to say to yourself at that moment, let me tell you the things I've learned in Sunday school. Let me tell you the words that I memorized. Let me tell you some parables that I learned about Jesus. Let me tell you about a psalm that begins, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All of these things have got to be ready. This is what it is to be a child of God. To have heard the lesson, to memorize a lot of those lines, because you just never know when you're going to need them, when it seems like you're starving and you want to turn stones into food, when you think that you're powerless you want to possess a lot more. And when you think that you're bigger than God, lest you dash your foot against a stone, that you begin to say to yourself, no, the Lord is my God, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down beside him in the still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will not for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head, my cup overflows. And I know that despite what I am going through right now, despite the temptation that is in front of me, that your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And because you have said it, I will live in your house forever. If we are the children of God, then we prepare ourselves to say the words we need to say at that right moment 
so that despite what the world says outside of ourselves, we on our lips say, but that's not who I am called to be. And by the very grace of God who baptized me, who feeds me with bread and wine on a Sunday, I shall listen to the little white one on my right shoulder who says to me, Fred, or your name, do you have some words you want to say at this moment? And I'll say, yeah, I remember some of them. And the little white angel says, you're going to start saying them now, kid, because you need to re-understand who you are <coughs> as you walk into Lent and follow Jesus into Jerusalem find out what real love is all about. Amen.